Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this back to school edition of the Aperio Teaching and Learning Meeting. Today is Wednesday, September the 5th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. I'll be facilitating this meeting. And unfortunately, you guys are going to hear a lot of me today because I'm also the presenter for this meeting. I'm going to be sharing some updates with you all from the Site Builder Project, which is a project in which UVA is collaborating with some other members of the Sakai community to try to reimagine the way that we create spaces for teaching and learning and research using Sakai. Thanks for that encouragement, Adam. Feel free to hang up on me later if you get tired of me. That's perfectly okay. Before we dive in here, I just wanted to give a couple of announcements. I know that many of us are not able to be here today because of back to school rush, and that includes two of our regular facilitators, Wilma and Tricia. So I'll try to stand in for them as much as I can and share some announcements with you guys. Uh, first of all, as you may have seen, if you've been following the Sakai lists, the Sakai code base for Sakai 19 has been frozen. So that's a very exciting development. Now we can move on to the next stages of testing and development for Sakai 19. So that's a very exciting development on that front. Also, I wanted to mention that registration is open for a couple of major events for the Sakai community later this year and into next year. Uh, first of all, registration is now open for Sakai Virtual Conference. Uh, Sakai Virtual Conference is scheduled for Wednesday, November the 7th. It's $50 a person or $500 for a group or institutional registration, and it's entirely online. I see that Dave has already signed up. That's awesome. I think that some of our UVA folks have already signed up as well. So we definitely encourage you guys to sign up for that if you haven't already to participate in that if you haven't already, because that is a really great event, a great opportunity for people to come together. There's a real focus on teaching and learning sessions. So practical applications of Sakai, how Sakai is actually being used in the classroom. There's a lot of great discussion of that and great use cases related to that. So I definitely encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. Sorry that you don't have your badge yet, Dave, for our virtual conference. Uh, I'm sure that's in the mail and Wilma's gonna get that to you as soon as she can. And Matt. thanks, Adam, for posting that link to the virtual conference in the chat. Yes, Terry, go right ahead. Um, yeah, I was going to say related to that, the call for papers is out there too. So all of that interesting discussion can uh, be started with with your wonderful experiences everybody's wonderful experiences on sakai and with developing courses and and all of the experiences and wonderful things that we have related to that you just need to submit your proposal and that will be um, assessed and probably scheduled in there Absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you, Terry. Don't just come and join us for the conference. Be a part of the conference as a presenter. Uh, we definitely want to hear how you're using Sakai at your institution, things that have worked, uh, things that are still in process, uh, things that you think could be helpful to other people at other institutions. Uh, please feel free to sign up and share your ideas with us and be a presenter because I know that there are other people out there in the community that would love to benefit from that. And there are multiple formats. You can do a full discussion of the full 35, 40 minutes, or you can be part of a lightning talk. If you just have something really quick and dirty that you want to present and there it is, um, just let us know and submit your proposal. You can also be a moderator and just kind of uh, regulate the sessions as they go in. And so let us know if you're interested in doing that as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Terry. And thanks, Adam, for posting those updated links uh, there in the chat. So if you haven't checked out those links already, please definitely do that so that you can learn more about how you can register and how you can participate. And as Josh points out, it's fun to moderate as well. So I know that Wilma is always recruiting moderators. So if you're interested in moderating sessions, uh, working with a presenter to help them with their session and make sure that it's as engaging and enlightening as possible, please feel free to reach out to Wilma Hodges because I know that she would be happy to recruit you for that purpose. So thanks for that reminder as well, Josh. 
Also wanted to mention that registration is open for Sakai Camp. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sakai Camp, Sakai Camp is a generally smaller, more unconference type gathering that usually happens in January. And this year it's scheduled for January 26th through January 30th. Uh, it's usually in Florida and it's in Florida again this year at the Holiday Inn Orlando Disney Springs. So you may have seen some email in the various Sakai lists about that. Uh, Sakai Camp is a really neat conference because it is more of an unconference. The agenda is shaped by the participants as they meet and as they discuss various items. And it's a place where people get to give a lot of input on the current and future direction of Sakai. So it's a place where you can make your opinions known and you can make your voice heard in a really strong and effective way. So if you haven't been to Sakai Camp before, if you have been to Sakai Camp and have really enjoyed it, we would encourage you to check that out. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with Wilma Hodges or with Chuck Severance, who is usually uh, one of the key players in setting that up for us every year. So be on the lookout for Sakai Camp January 26th through January 30th in Orlando. I see we've got a couple more people here on the call. I see Josh is here. Uh, anybody else have any other announcements that we want to share before we dive in and move on to our main presentation? I'll give everybody just a couple of minutes to come on the mic or to post something in the chat. Before the presentation, are we going to have a JIRA discussion as in the Etherpad? Because I've got a live one. Adam, if you've got a live one, let's take a couple of minutes and do that. Do you mind posting that in the chat for us here and walking us through it? I don't. Let me grab that to the clipboard, and I will post it in the chat, and we'll also put it in the Etherpad. But uh, this literally was just filed within the last hour, and uh, it was affecting our institution, so I wanted to bring it up on teaching and learning because um, I'm sure it will affect other institutions as well who are on Sakai 12. Um, if you use the clog tool and the user's name has an apostrophe in it, they will not be able to use the clog tool. Thanks, Dave, for the uh, validation, but yes, it's an issue. Um, we actually have instructors who are um, uh, encouraging use or requiring use of CLOG within their classes, and any O'Malley, O'Shaughnessy, O'Kelly, or whatever will not be able to view CLOG. Okay, so we have some comments here in the chat. The, the new workaround is that those people must undergo a mandatory name change. That seems perfectly acceptable. Absolutely. Thanks, Everybody Dave. Everybody will be smashed. <laughs> That's right. We're going to shorten and simplify everything, Adam. I think this is a great idea. And absolutely, I agree, Dave, that this is a fair JIRA, something that we need to look into. And so, as always, uh, with these JIRAs that we discuss here in our teaching and learning calls, please uh, go to those JIRAs, uh, visit those links that Adam has posted there, uh, make your comments and give your votes for those JIRAs so that they can stay on the radar for our developers to investigate as soon as possible. Dave is absolutely right Dave. that apostrophes are not going to disappear from people's names. Yeah. Adam, do you know anything about whether this is a regression? I have vague memories of having run into this in the past, and I thought it had been fixed. So it does seem to me to be a regression. Those memories could be uh, invented or fallacious. So uh, I'm going to have to go back through support tickets to see if we've run into this historically. But um, uh, yes, it does seem to be a regression, and hopefully it can get some love real soon now. 
Absolutely. So thanks so much, Adam, for bringing this to everybody's attention. And again, please check out that link that Adam has posted here in the chat. Visit the JIRA and make your votes, make your comments there. Uh, if you use the clog tool and if you're experiencing this as well, if you host your own instance, if you are working with a vendor, uh, please give as much information as you can and please indicate your support for that JIRA so that we can dive in and get it fixed. Any other announcements or comments that folks have before we dive into our main event here? Could I offer one announcement? Matt? Absolutely. Um, so, Go right ahead, Josh. So the announcement is this. Um, now that uh, semester start is, uh, the, the, the worst of semester start has passed, I want to reiterate the announcement that Longsite continues to seek a senior Sakai developer. Um, so this is uh, not a replacement for Matt Jones, because no one could ever replace Matt Jones, uh, but is uh, more of a successor, someone who's going to be you know, look a lot more like Earl, you know, someone who's going to focus on a lot of the infrastructural development that needs to happen in Sakai in terms of technical debt, among among many other things. But um, for sure, not a, you know, not not a Matt clone. So with all that said, um, I would I would love any recommendations that this group could offer. Thanks, Josh. I think that's a great idea to crowdsource this a bit amongst the group because we can put our collective heads together, share this with our collective networks, and hopefully help you all find some great candidates that would be great additions to the community. We do have some questions here in the chat. Uh, does this person need to look like Earl? Are there requirements to shave their head? We need to get some answers from you all, I think, as we pursue these amongst our various networks. What do you think about that? It's a really good point. Um, no, I was hoping for someone taller than Earl, actually, and uh, I think <laughs> someone with more hair than Earl would be a good thing. And as Laura Sear points out, uh, she's more worried about what's inside their head, and that does seem uh, fair, especially for those of us who depend on developers on a daily basis, uh, which is certainly the case for me. Who do you want interested parties to contact, Josh? Should they contact you directly, or is there a generic long site address that they should contact? Good question. So they're welcome to contact me directly. They can also email search at longsite.com. Um, I pasted a Google Doc with the job description in the Etherpad, so people can take a look at that. And that is, you're welcome to send that around. Um, that will eventually make it onto our site, don't ask. Um, but uh, that's, you know, this is, this is the kind of person that we're looking for. Great. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that, Josh. Terry asks about uh, location. Uh, everyone at Longside works remotely, so the person needs to be US based, but otherwise, there are no other geographic restrictions. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate the help. Absolutely, Josh. Thank you for everything. That Longsight does for the community. We want to help you out as much as we can because we know that that's going to help us out in the long run. So thanks again for sharing all this info with us here. Any other announcements or comments? Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to share my screen with you all, and then we can get started here. I apologize, guys, for the dramatic pause. And now you all should be able to see my screen. Is that showing up for you? Excellent. Okay.
So I'm going to put us into presenter mode here, so I won't be able to see the chat at this point. Um, so if you have questions or comments as we move through the presentation, I don't think this is going to take me very long to share this overview with you. So feel free to post any of those comments in the chat or come on the mic at any time. And if they're in the chat, I will certainly get to them as soon as I finish sharing this brief overview with you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Site Builder Project, I want to tell you just a little bit about what that is. And in a sentence, it's an attempt to transform the way that we create spaces for teaching and learning and research in Sakai, uh, especially through that site creation process. This is a process that hasn't received many updates in the latest versions of Sakai, even as Sakai's UI has continued to evolve and change. And so we wanted to change that. We wanted to reimagine that site creation process to transform it from a weakness in the way that Sakai works and the way that Sakai works with creators to build teaching and learning spaces into a strength for those things. And so we have a number of highlights that are incorporated in this project, which is ongoing at this time. Uh, obviously, we want to introduce a sleek, modern interface that's optimized for all devices. Uh, we want something that's going to look good not only on your desktop, but also on a mobile device. It's an increasing number of our instructors, at least, are starting to create sites and interact with sites primarily through devices like tablets. We also want to offer new options to search and sort and filter tools. Currently, many of you may be familiar with the Manage Tools list that has remained the same in Sakai for the last several installations. And there aren't very many options there to search or sort or filter tools. You really just need to scroll through that alphabetical list. And so we wanted to offer some new options there to allow instructors and site creators to find the tools that they need and that can help them more quickly. We wanted to offer new site types, uh, new site templates to connect you with the tools and the content related to your goals. So we wanted to work with some of our outstanding instructional designers here at UVA to help develop some prepackaged site templates that would connect instructors with the things that they need even more quickly. We wanted to offer custom recommendations based on who you are and what you do. So we wanted to take the information that we know about you from the way that you've used the system previously and provide you with some intelligent options. So we want to provide you with quick ways to duplicate your previous sites if that's what you normally do in the system. We want to provide you with recommendations for the tools that are going to be most helpful to you. So we wanted to offer some more intelligent options there. And we wanted to offer a brand new feature, an innovative intuitive site creation wizard that helps create your sites with you in a question and answer format. So something similar to the now famous wizard that many of us have used with TurboTax, where you're completing your taxes without even knowing it as you go through and answer some basic questions. We wanted to offer an option like that for new instructors and also for experienced instructors who might want something a little more informal as they go through that site creation process. Something where the process is working with them uh, instead of against them in some ways. There are a number of key partners that are participating in this project. This is a project that is not limited to a single group, but involves multiple groups here at UVA and throughout the Sakai community. So we're very grateful to the Office of the Vice President for Information Technology here at UVA, who's provided a significant amount of the funding for the project. Uh, we're also very grateful to the UVA Collab Applications Group, which is the group that manages the instance of Sakai here at UVA, and also the Learning Design and Technology Group, which is the primary instructional design team for the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences here at UVA. Those two groups are really partnering together on the bulk of the project, the project management and the development of much of the text and media and other content related to the project. 
We're also very grateful to Journey Group, uh, which is a web design firm based here in Charlottesville, Virginia, who's providing the majority of the project interface design. Uh, they are responsible for the majority of the design that you'll see in the mock-ups that we'll look at at the end of this overview. And we're also grateful to many members of the Sakai community who have met with us and consulted with us on various stages of the project, particularly the Office of Learning Innovation at Duke University, uh, because as many of you know, they are involved in an interface redesign project for the whole of Sakai, a project that has been underway for the last 12 to 18 months or so. And we're very grateful to them for consulting with us and trying to make sure that these two projects are working in concert with one another as we try to tackle uh, various design and interface improvements for Sakai. So just a brief timeline of the things that we've done thus far. So this project was formally approved and the funding was provided uh, in December of 2017. So in December of last year. Uh, by March of this year, our project committee, uh, which includes members from the UVA Collab Applications Group and the Learning Design and Technology Group here at UVA, had met multiple times, had received proposals from multiple potential design partners and had selected Journey Group here in Charlottesville as our chosen design partner. And we began working with them in March as soon as that selection was finalized. In April of this year, we scheduled some focus groups that involve not only faculty, but also students. Uh, we wanted to sit down with our faculty, with our students, and with our design partners from Journey Group to discuss their needs, what they liked about the system, what they would like to improve uh, so that we could get some real on the ground feedback from them before we started to dive in and move beyond the initial prototypes that some of you have seen at Open Aperio conferences previously. We also followed up by distributing a site creation survey uh, online using the university's subscription to Qualtrics. Some of you may be familiar with Qualtrics, a really great survey tool uh, and a great tool for us to distribute a survey and get additional feedback from faculty and from others who weren't able to participate in a face-to-face -face focus group. So we received about 100 additional responses from faculty and others in addition to our face-to-face -face focus group participants. All of that work led to the finalization of what we call an experience map, uh, something that we developed in consultation with Journey to try to map out the various paths that people can take through that site creation process in a two-dimensional way. Uh, and we'll take a look at part of that here in this overview so that you can see some of the things that we mapped out as we created that map and some of the things that were important to us as we created and reviewed that map. And using that map, we've continued to develop a basic design framework, and that design framework has been generally finalized at this point. And now that we are moving into September of 2018, we are starting to actually sit down with our design partner, Journey Group, and begin to write the code for the front-end application, the new user interface for that site creation process. So when we started to get feedback from our faculty, from our students, from our various stakeholders here, we got some very positive feedback and we were very excited to see that. We were excited to see that people love Collab, which is what we call Sakai here at UVA, and that they prefer it uh, to other systems such as Blackboard, which is in use by some parts of the university as well. And we got some appreciation for the fact that we have teams of people here at UVA that are continuing to refine and improve the products that we have in direct response to feedback from our faculty and students and other stakeholders. And this is something that I think is really, really important when we think about Sakai and what it can do for all of us and for our institutions. The fact that it is entirely customizable and that it allows all of our great 
developers and instructional support staff and instructional designers to actually partner with our faculty and students to build great things, not just take a product off the shelf. And we saw a lot of appreciation for that uh, from our respondents, and we were very excited to see that. But of course, we saw some important constructive criticism as well, and I was particularly moved by this first response here, which was given by one of our survey respondents, that when they go through the site creation process, they try to remember what they did last time and just click and pray. And while that was only one response from one respondent, I suspect that there are a number of people who are doing the same thing, who are crossing their fingers, who are saying a little prayer, who are clicking random buttons, random options, and just hoping that things turn out the way that they turned out in the previous semester or the previous year. And so we certainly wanted to try to address that with this project. We also saw things that many of us experienced in our own work with Sakai, like the fact that some tasks take multiple pages and clicks, and it would really be helpful if we could streamline that, if we could reduce uh, some of that clutter, some of that red tape associated with the site creation process. We saw feedback like the fact that tool names are not always intuitive uh, and that there aren't always easy, accessible links to things like the online help system, uh, which many of our users have found to be more helpful. That's something that we have continued to develop very actively here in the last 12 to 18 months at UVA. And people would like even more links to that and uh, even more ready access to that. We also saw a lot of interest in and requests for ways to access or learn more about how other faculty, other students, other stakeholders are using the various tools, the various site types that are out there. Uh, we were very interested to see that faculty want to learn from other faculty. Uh, they want to see what other faculty have found to be helpful, what other faculty have found to be less helpful. And that's obviously not an option that's really available in the current site creation process in Sakai. So we saw a significant amount of interest in that and we wanted to try to find ways to bring that into our new reimagined site creation process. So using all of this feedback, we started to build an experience map to map out the various paths that people can take when they create a site in Sakai. And this is an excerpt from that experience map. Uh, some things became clear to us as we started to map these things out in two dimensions. One of the things that we saw was that we wanted to add this new option, this from questionnaire option or from site creation wizard option to provide a more interactive and less intimidating way for new and experienced uh, site creators to move through that site creation process. We wanted to provide this new option because we felt like it would open up some new opportunities for all of our stakeholders. Uh, we also wanted to make sure to find a way to retain and incorporate a from existing option or a duplicate site option as it's called now in Sakai. Some of you may be aware that the duplicate site option is scheduled to be removed uh, from default Sakai in our next upgrade, um, that it's going to be turned off by default for performance reasons. Uh, this is a feature that's heavily used uh, here at UVA. There are a number of programs and departments, a number of individual faculty who rely on the fact that they can simply create a copy of a course that they have taught repeatedly in the past and move with that copy directly into a new semester. So we wanted to find a way to preserve and incorporate that option into our experience map. And developing this map also showed us that really, as we think about the site creation process, this duplicate site option really belongs with the other site creation options more than its current location, which is within an existing site in which you have to access in order to duplicate that site. It seemed more logical to us to place all of those site creation options together in one single flow. It was also important for us as we started to map these things out to make it easier for people to move 
back and forth uh, through the site creation process as they see fit. Uh, people might start to create a site with one particular path. They might start by building their own site using the from scratch option as it is here on the experience map and then decide that they want to do something else and we wanted to make it easy not only for people to move forward in that site creation process but also to move backward uh, if that's something that they want to do even if they get to the end of that process and they have all their tools if they decide that they need one or two more tools to do their very best work in their site we want to make it easy for them to go back grab those two tools and complete the process without feeling like they are moving in a weird or unusual path. Uh, so we want to make it easy not only for people to move forward, but for people to move backward. So now at this point, I want to show you all some mock-ups of some potential screens for this new site creation process. Obviously, I should say at this point that these mock-ups are still tentative. These are entirely static images. They're not clickable in any way, and there's no code behind any of these. So these are still very tentative. But I wanted to share them with you just to give you a sense of where we are at this stage of the project, uh, where we are at this stage of the design process, the kinds of things uh, that we're thinking about, and the general things that have motivated us as we have developed the project to this point. So this is how we are imagining the beginning of that site creation process with a simple branch between creating a course site or a collaboration site, which is what we call project sites here at UVA. Uh, collaboration sites are something that we are very interested in at UVA, uh, that we would like to expand at UVA going forward. Uh, obviously, this is an option that not all learning management systems offer. Uh, not all LMSs offer the opportunity to create non-course sites, but this is something uh, that is an advantage of Sakai and that is heavily used here at UVA. And so. We want to offer both of these options right here in a very simple, modern workflow. You'll notice that we've also modernized the frame of our instance of Sakai here slightly. You see that we've uh, added some different colors here, uh, restyled some things uh, slightly in order to give that more modern look and feel, not only in the center of the page here, where site creators can select their course or collaboration site type, uh, but also here uh, in the tools menu. Notice also that you can cancel out of this process at any time. Uh, we'll see this cancel button on various screens, again, to make it easier and more intelligible for site creators to move back, forward, or even out of that site creation process as they're going through it, because that option is not necessarily readily apparent in the current workflow, which means that people often end up clicking the back button, uh, which as we know is not always a great idea uh, in Sakai given its current architecture. So we see here on this first screen, uh, basic, updated, modern workflow. We see uh, some nice description here of what each of those site types are, and then a very clear option to get started creating your course site or creating your collaboration site. From there, if you select that create course site option, you have the option to tell us a little something else about your course, uh, beginning with the academic term, uh, because the academic term is how we allow site creators to select any course rosters that need to be added to their course so that their participants can be added automatically. So again, there are just some minor updates uh, to this screen, mostly related to the design of the interface uh, to make it a little more modern, to make it a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, two very simple options here, very straightforward, very easy to follow, uh, selecting your academic term, and if you wish, then selecting a roster to go with that academic term. Once you've selected those things, again, there's a very clear option to continue, or you can cancel out of the site creation process at this point, or here at the bottom of the page, there's an option to change uh, the type of the site that you're creating. From that point, you provide some additional information about your course. Uh, 
such as the course title. Uh, currently, in our instance of Sakai, if an instructor selects a roster during the previous stage of the site creation process, this title is populated automatically with the title of the roster, and that may continue in our instance of Sakai as well. Um, but the course site title can be provided here, and then also a short description. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the site creation process in Sakai, currently you know that that site information display screen that appears in the site creation process is pretty long and unwieldy and there are a number of options there that are rarely ever changed and so something that came out of our focus groups and also our survey feedback was that for those few sites that want to change some of those options, those are options that can be configured once the site has been created. But for the majority of courses, they simply need something more streamlined here. Uh, just two simple options, a title which is required and an optional description, rather than uh, the six or seven options that exist on the current page that require some significant scrolling. And then after making those selections, you reach the point where you choose the path that you would like to follow uh, to create your site. And there are four options here, just as we saw those four options presented on that two-dimensional experience map that we looked at a moment ago. So from left to right here, you have the quick guide or your site creation build assistant, your site creation wizard uh, that helps you build your site by answering just a few questions. You have the option uh, to create your site from scratch uh, to build your site custom. You have the option to create your site from a template. Uh, we have a number of templates uh, in our system currently, uh, some of which have been developed by us, some of which have been developed by our excellent instructional designers, some of which have been developed by instructional designers associated with particular schools or departments here at UVA. And so as we continue to add and refine those templates, uh, we want to make sure uh, that site creators can find those uh, readily and find the one that will work best for them. You can also create your site from a copy or uh, from a duplicate uh, of one of your previous sites. Notice here on this page that the option to create your site using the quick guide is slightly enlarged uh, and is recommended as we see here by this text. Uh, we're also considering the possibility of making this recommended option intelligent uh, so that based on your previous use of the system, if you have created sites in the past using duplicates, then your from copy option would be enlarged and would be recommended here. So it's possible that this recommendation is not simply static uh, and the same for everyone, but that it might also be dynamic and intelligent in which we could recommend the option that you have used most or that has worked best for you previously. So for example, if you select that quick guide option, then you'll have the opportunity to answer a very small number of questions, uh, hopefully three or four or five short questions uh, that will allow us to make some recommendations about the templates or the tools that you might want to consider as you build your site. Uh, so for example, answering how many students are participating in your course and where your course is going to meet. Uh, again, we would imagine those questions being presented in the same kind of sleek and updated and modern format uh, that users are now familiar with uh, from other websites and from other software. Uh, we want them to see uh, the kinds of modern polished features that they know and appreciate from other websites and other software showing up in Sakai as well. So in addition to telling us things about the size of your course, where your course might be located, we might also ask you what kinds of things you would like to do uh, in your site, which will obviously help us recommend specific tools and templates that will help you accomplish those goals. And so just as in some cases you may select only one answer, uh, in other cases you may need to select multiple answers, and the Quick Guide will be able to support that as well.
You'll also have the option to skip questions if you don't feel like questions are relevant uh, to your particular course or your particular workflows. Uh, you can skip those questions instead of responding to each one. And again, you can cancel out of the site creation process at any time using this readily available cancel button. You can also move to a different path if you decide that you don't need to answer these questions, if you'd like to dive in on your own, if you'd like to move directly to a template, uh, you can follow this choose a new path link and return to that point in the process. And so if you select that custom option, for example, this is one view that you might see. So one reimagining of the current Manage Tools page uh, that we have in Sakai. And so there are some things that are familiar about this page. So we see a format that is generally similar to the line item list format that we have in the current version of Sakai. But there are also uh, some additional features here uh, that I think are very helpful. First, of course, we see a sleek and modern and updated design here for this page. But we also see a search bar here that will allow us to quickly search and filter down to particular tools and then select them here uh, just by uh, clicking this slider here to add them. We also see uh, some sorting options, and you notice here that in this mock-up, the popularity sorter has been selected. So there are options to quickly sort the tools by the tools that are most popular, uh, by the tools uh, in alphabetical order, or to filter them uh, according to a particular category. Uh, so to filter to the tools that are primarily associated with communication or the tools that are primarily associated with grading and assessment, uh, to see the tools that are built to accomplish those particular tasks, those particular sets of goals uh, that you have in your site. Obviously, you can select the tools that you would like to use in your site on this page and then move to the review tool set screen to finalize that process. Uh, or if you prefer a different view option, more reminiscent of the now common App Store model, you can select that as well. And if you want to learn more about a particular tool, which is not really an option that's available in the current version of Sakai, you can click that More Info button and get a modal window, which is also reminiscent of that now common App Store model, uh, that will give you the opportunity not only to read a little bit more about what that tool is, how that tool can help you accomplish your goals, but also access some screenshots, access some media, interact with the tool and learn more about it in a variety of ways before you even add it uh, to the tool set for your site. But of course there is an option to add that tool to your site right here from this modal window so that once you pull that up and you're sold on what that tool can do and how that tool can help you, you can add that to your tool set for your site right here from this window. And if you prefer that now common App Store model, over the list model, you can quickly change that view uh, from the list uh, to the App Store view uh, just by selecting this view option here, uh, which will just shift uh, that view from the list into the card view. Uh, you can see that there have been uh, some tools recommended here, um, you know, again, based on some of that intelligent information uh, that we're getting uh, about you, about what site creators have preferred in general in the system. Uh, we're considering all of those options for making recommendations. And just like that list view, uh, you can quickly add tools to your tool set by selecting the sliders here, or you can pull up those modal windows to learn more about any tool uh, just by clicking that More Info button. You also see the same options to quickly search and filter down uh, to various tools from the list, which gives us all the opportunity to add additional tools, add additional integrations without feeling like that list is becoming too cumbersome and too unwieldy for site creators to navigate because there are quick options that will allow you to filter down there. And just like that list view, once you have made all of your selections and picked all the tools that you would like to add to your tool set, you can click this Review Tool Set button to move to 
that final stage of the site creation process, approving that tool set that you've selected. And then you'll have several options here in the footer bar at the bottom of the page. Uh, if you want to go back and continue to look at some tools, again, just as there are easy options to navigate forward through the process, there are easy options to navigate backwards. So if you want to go back and look at some tools and consider a few other options, you can do that just by clicking this Browse Tools button. Uh, you can, of course, click the Publish Site button to publish your site from here. Uh, the standard conclusion to that site creation process. Uh, there's also a readily available option here to save your site as a draft or what Sakai currently calls uh, publishing your site as an unpublished uh, site. Uh, that option is not necessarily readily available in the current site creation workflow, but that is an option that is being used by an increasing number of instructors and site creators here at UVA who want to create their site, but then want to continue to add content, want to continue to refine it before making it available to their students or other participants. And so we wanted to make that option a little more prominent it a little more discernible, a little more readily available to them because many of our site creators were not familiar that that option even existed uh, in the current workflow. So we wanted to make that prominent here as a conclusion to the site creation workflow as well. So just some details about what's next for this project. Uh, this is where we are currently, but some details about what's coming up in the future. So uh, for the next several months, obviously, we're going to continue that technical integration process, uh, which has now begun between our developers here at UVA and the developers at Journey Group. Uh, we're also going to continue uh, that content creation process, you know, creating uh, some of the text and the media and the other content uh, that needs to be created uh, for all of these various tools, which is a process in which the UVA Collab Applications Group and the Learning Design and Technology Group are participating heavily along with Journey Group. We're also starting to work on creating some new uh, site templates, uh, which is a process that's really being led by the great instructional designers that we have here at the Learning Design and Technology Group. At this point, we're anticipating that we're going to begin our primary QA testing uh, of the project in January of next year. And we're hoping that if we can begin that primary QA testing by January of next year, that that QA testing will be completed uh, by May of next year, uh, which will mean that the project will be complete and will soft launch here at UVA in time for our summer term, uh, which normally begins in June. So we're hoping to have this ready so that we can soft launch in June. We'll have the opportunity to work with and support a smaller group of site creators who are here working at UVA and online in the summertime. We'll have the opportunity to get their feedback, iron out uh, any issues that might be present there in the initial soft launch, and then make this ready for everyone at UVA in time for the fall semester in August. Uh, we're also planning at this point that once we've had the opportunity to soft launch the project here at UVA and work out any initial issues that might be present uh, that we can contribute this code uh, back to the Sakai community so that anybody who uh, wants to use this, who wants to incorporate this into their site creation workflow as well, will have the opportunity to do that. And we've been very fortunate here at UVA to work with a number of great uh, developers in the Sakai community, people like Brian Jones and Steve Swinsberg, who are going to work on this project, uh, not only to help us develop it initially, but help us contribute that code back to the Sakai community. And if you want to learn more about this project, and I hope that you do, um, please visit our project page uh, on the Aperio Farm website. Uh, this project is not a traditional farm project in the sense that we are soliciting money from you, uh, but we're definitely uh, soliciting your information and your interest and your feedback. Um, so please uh, visit the Aperio Farm website, which is farm.aperio.org, and we are listed there among the current crop of projects. So visit our page there uh, to learn more about this project and the various groups that are involved in it and what we're doing. Or uh, reach out to me directly uh, at any time. Um, 
my address uh, is just my name with a period in the middle of it, matthew.burgess at virginia.edu. Uh, you can also reach out uh, to Trisha Gordon, the director of the UVA Collab Applications Group, who has been the real driving force uh, behind this project. You can reach out to her at Trisha at virginia.edu. You can also follow us on social media at UVA Collab on Twitter. Uh, I occasionally will post updates and screenshots and mock-ups and other things uh, related to the project. So if you want to learn more, uh, if you want to uh, get involved and give us your interest and give us your feedback, uh, please feel free to do that at any time. We would love to hear from you. So I'm going to get out of full screen mode here. so that I can see some comments in the chat. And I see some comments about clicking and praying. So I'm glad to see that other people have experienced that. I'm glad to see that that's not just folks at UVA who have worked with people who are clicking and praying. Um, I see that Adam does that whenever he works with a computer, and I totally understand that. We just want to try to reduce that, uh, at least for our instructors, as much as possible, because I'm not sure that all of their prayers are necessarily being answered. I see some comments here from Dave uh, about you know the cancel button being similar to YouTube. Um, yes, I think that's right. I think that's one of the things uh, that we have seen from our design partner journey group in general is that you know we want the site creation process uh, to feel like other sites that our site creators and our stakeholders know and love. You know, we really want. Um, this to feel like the other things that they really love about the internet. And I think those things really showed up in some of the design elements that Journey Group has incorporated into our initial designs here. And I do see some comments uh, from Dave and from Adam and from others about automated site creation. And so I understand that for those of you who do automated site creation, uh, this is not going to be as exciting for your user base. Uh, while this may be exciting for you, and I hope this will be exciting for you, uh, this was a project that was primarily created with the idea of site creators who are creating their own sites, uh, which is the way that we do it here at UVA. Um, because I think one of the real selling points for Sakai at UVA has always been customizability. Uh, we have a very talented but a very fiercely independent group of faculty here at UVA, and they want to be able to do things their way. They want to be able to accomplish their own use cases. And so, you know, we wanted to work on a site creation process that would really maximize uh, that customizability that we also see in our talented faculty. And so we see some comments here about uh, filtering by tools. Yep, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think filtering by tools uh, is going to be a, a really valuable option, especially as we continue to add, you know, multiple options uh, for some of those categories. You know, we want to be able to put people in touch with those tools that will help them accomplish those goals uh, very quickly. I see a question here from Adam uh, that there's no code behind this, uh, but that he assumes that the recommended tools would be customizable by each institution. That's a great question, Adam. Obviously, since we have been working on this here at UVA as a single institution, that's not a question that has been asked, to my knowledge. But I know that that is something that we have certainly been working on here as an institution, is making as much of this as possible completely customizable at the institutional level. You know, for example, one of the things we've talked about a lot is making you know all the color schemes you know making all of the skinning uh, completely customizable by institution and we've been doing some work on that and we've actually hired a brand new ui ux developer here in our group at uva to help us with that so while i haven't heard discussion of that specific question adam i think that's a great point um, and it's something that I can definitely bring to our development team to make sure that's part of that customizability conversation that we have.
I see a comment from Dave that mocking up these wireframes was a lot of work. Uh, it definitely was. Um, in this case, I think that was one of the advantages of working with a design partner that does this for a living. You know, this kind of interface design, website design is a big part of what Journey does. Uh, they do a lot of websites. Uh, they do a lot of digital publication work. Uh, they do a lot of work uh, for UVA specifically and for other educational institutions. So I think that was a real advantage for us, um, was working with people who do this and only this for a living so that we could take uh, some basic mock-ups that I had made in years previous that some of you may have seen and just some general ideas that we had, throw those things at them and get something uh, really refined in response. I see a comment from Laura Sear that she wants this process right now. We're working on that, Laura. Come on. You know we're working on that. And I know you're going to help me with that, which is very exciting. I see a question from Dave uh, about whether this would fully replace the current workflow. Um, for us, at least here at UVA, that is the idea, uh, that this is going to become the new site creation workflow uh, for us here at UVA. Now, I know at the very least uh, we have had discussions and have made plans about making this uh, enableable at the property level um, so that you can turn this on or off in your instance uh, at the very least. Um, but yes, that is the plan at UVA is to make this the new site creation process. And I see a question from Josh here for institutions uh, that provision basic course sites that need customization. Uh, could this workflow be available for those existing sites? So I'm not entirely sure that I understand your question, Josh, but I think that I understand it. And if I understand it correctly, we also imagine that that screen that I showed you uh, that would appear during that custom site creation option, that from scratch option, would also be what appears when you manage tools within an existing site. Uh, notice that those two screens are currently identical uh, to one another in the current workflow in Sakai. So we would definitely um, imagine that if you had already created a site, even if you hadn't used this workflow, there would still be a possibility that when you manage tools in that created site, you would see those screens uh, that we saw that would also appear during the custom site creation option. Well, thank you guys, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you all taking some time out of your very busy back to school schedules um, to sit down and go through this with us and, uh, and hear some updates and, uh, and give us some feedback. It sounds like generally people are feeling positive about it and feeling excited. And I am certainly uh, very excited that you guys are excited. Um, so thank you all again for giving me a few minutes to share some of this info with you. Um, and of course, if you all have questions, if you want to learn more, uh, please uh, reach out uh, to me directly via email or uh, follow that project page on the Aperio website. And thank you, Adam, for reminding me. Uh, we do have uh, a call coming up uh, two weeks from today, uh, which will be Wednesday, September 19th. Uh, that's going to be, uh, as Adam pointed out in the chat, Pharmapalooza. Uh, so we're going to be discussing and getting updates uh, from some various farm projects uh, from that same website that I was just mentioning to you all, farm.aperio.org. So we will be uh, hearing from and getting some more updates from other projects in the farm pipeline, which is a really cool thing uh, where a lot of different projects throughout the community are getting uh, widespread interest and involvement and to brainstorm some upcoming topics. Absolutely. So uh, again, if you have thoughts or ideas about upcoming teaching and learning calls uh, for October and beyond, uh, we would love to hear them. Uh, please send those directly to me via email or to Tricia or to Wilma uh, via email. We'd love to hear from you all. I know that you all are doing uh, great things at your institutions. And so if you have availability, if you have ideas for October and beyond, feel, please feel free to share those with us directly. And uh, I see a question from Mary Jane in the chat about the next call date. Uh, the next call date will be two weeks from today. Uh, so that is Wednesday, September 19th. 
same bat time, same bat channel, 10 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point since we're one minute over. Thank you guys for sticking with us for an extra minute, and we look forward to seeing you right back here in two weeks. Thanks very much, and have a good rest of your day.